search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better Good morning, everybody. 
Glad to have you guys here today. Glad that you're here to worship with us. Excited about some things we're going to get to dive into today. If you're a guest and you've never had an opportunity to fill out one of our communication cards, they're in the seat pockets there in front of you. If you take a moment and fill out one of those, if you stop by Welcome Central out in the lobby when you leave, we have a gift that we'd like to be able to give to you. We have been in a series, hashtag up to us, and as you maybe saw it when you come in, um, we have t-shirts out in the lobby. They're free. We want everybody to have one. We had, ran out last week of some sizes, and so we kind of filled those in and got some more. So please grab you a t-shirt when you leave if you haven't gotten one yet. And when somebody says, hey, what does that mean? Hashtag up to us. You just say, look, if we're going to make a difference in this community, we believe it's up to us. If our church is going to be strong, we believe that it's up to us. God has delegated responsibility to us. So just say, hey, we want to make a difference. It's up to us. Us, and that is, I think, a good explanation of what that is about. We talked a little bit about the hashtag, what that symbol means, but I want to show you some other symbols real quickly because the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, is filled with symbols, all kinds of symbolism, and several of those are going to come out today. We're going to talk about them, and so I wanted to just show you a few things that are going to come out. You can be listening real carefully and paying attention. Bread is going to be a part of the message today. Probably not bread just like this. It probably was unleavened bread. But this gives you a picture, an idea, of that symbol. We're going to hear today about white stones, okay? I don't want to tip my hand and give away too much, but you want one, all right? I'm just going to let you know now you want a white stone. We'll talk about that later. This represents a crown. It was the only thing I could find in the closet, okay? I know you don't want one of these. I know you don't want to look like this. I'm just saying a crown is going to be talked about today. There also is going to be a sword today. Um, and so a sword is going to be discussed. It is a double-edged sword that will come up. And so just wanted to kind of give you a picture, an idea of that. And then the last thing that I've got up here is a staff. And so... This is not specifically in the text, but it plays into what we're going to talk about. And to be honest with you, this is a little bit awkward to say. This staff is supposed to have a snake wrapped around it, and I'm not sure where it is. So if you'd look under your pews and see if you... If you I'm sorry. Okay, I want you to pretend that there is a snake wrapped around this staff. We'll get to that a little bit later as well. So those are some things to keep in mind, and of course, it will be on the quiz. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of worship that we could gather here to sing and to, to just bring our hearts before you, Lord. Would you speak to us today? We just invite you into everything that we're going to do during this service. We know that you're here, and we want to honor you. Lord, we pray for those who are shining your light into the darkness, just not just here, but around the world. I want to pray today for Mark Mobley and the team that is leaving today to go to Uganda Lord, as they pour into an orphanage that's being built there and as they work with leaders there to impact the next generation, I just pray that you would really bless and guide each one going. And uh, we pray that they would have boldness and, uh, and safety as well. God, thank you that we get to be a part of your work in this world. We know that it's up to us to do our part, and we want to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Pergamos is the third city and is located north of Ephesus, about 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. Pergamos means elevated, and it sits at an elevation of around 1,000 feet. Due to this natural elevation, it was considered impregnable, with many kings depositing their treasures here for safekeeping. Lysimachus deposited a treasure here estimated to be $10 million worth. It also had a library to rival the world-famous Alexandrian Library and contained 200,000 volumes according to Plutarch and was also the seat of the Roman province's Supreme Court. Jesus tells them, I know your works, where you dwell and where Satan's seat is. Pergamos was the center of Satan's religion. 
When the Persians overthrew the Babylonians, the defeated Babylonian priests later led a revolt. But the Chaldean priests had to retreat and fled to Asia Minor and fix their central college here in Pergamos. This religion is based on the claim that they provided a bridge between heaven and earth. The ruling monarch had many titles, one of which was Pontifex Maximus. Pont means bridge, factio means make, and Maximus means the greatest. Put together, it means the greatest bridge builder. When Caesar became emperor of Rome and Pontifex Maximus of the world's religion, it signified a connecting link between the two Babylons, between ancient and modern, literal and spiritual, with Pergamus playing a connecting role between the two. Now a danger far more insidious than the flames of persecution existed. Half-baked Christians, wolves in sheep's clothing, people who said they're Christian but still continued certain pagan practices but with new names or alleged meaning attached. This marked the beginning of a separation between the compromised majority and the maligned and persecuted minority. Not everyone who says they are Christian is a Christian. May we be faithful to God and cling to his word and its principles and not sway for popularity and favor with men. When I was growing up, we had a saying Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. In the game of horseshoes, if you don't get a ringer, but you throw one close enough to the pole, you can still get a point. And with hand grenades, whether you're sitting on top of it or sitting next to it, it's still going to hurt because close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. But see, back in the day, somebody would miss a shot in basketball or they would drop a pass in football and they would say, well, I was close. And it's like, well, nice try, pal, but close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. You remember the old show Get Smart, right? Steve Carell uh, did a remake of a movie just a few years ago. How many times did Maxwell Smart, uh, you know, he'd, he'd shoot at the bad guy and he would hit a priceless antique instead, or he'd be trying to swing on a rope through the door and he'd hit the wall instead and he would say what? Missed it by that much, <laughs> exactly. Because he was close, but close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Even in church, sometimes we talk about near misses. There was an old hymn that the church sang when I was a kid, and it was almost persuaded. And no offense to anybody here, but it was a dreary, sort of dreadful song about somebody who almost decides to be a Christian and doesn't. And the last verse concludes, almost but lost. It was not my favorite song when, uh, when I was growing up. But the deal is, it, it kind of is true. Almost is not enough. Close doesn't count. You barely miss the field goal, you get exactly zero points. You almost shoot the bad guy, but he gets away, he still gets away. If the teacher says, what's two plus two, it doesn't matter if you say five, which is close, or 437, which is way off. Either answer is wrong because close doesn't count, right? You can be almost right and still be wrong, practically good and still be bad. Jesus said those who are not for us aren't close. They are against us. If you're not on, you're off. If you're not in, you're out. No matter how close you are. Because close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. I want to give you a bottom line this morning. We're just going to do it early in the message. And then we're going to dig into the text. We'll talk about why this matters. What it means. And so, so here we go. Almost right is still wrong. That's the bottom line today. Almost right is still wrong. Almost good is still bad. Almost moral is still immoral. Almost healthy is still unhealthy. Almost alive is still dead. So we're in this series right now. It's based on seven letters that were written to seven churches in the book of Revelation. And these churches were in seven ancient cities in Asia. See, when the Apostle John was an old man, he was exiled to a remote island 
Patmos. And while he was there, he received a vision from heaven. It was Jesus himself who instructed John to write these messages to the churches. Now, these churches had different personalities. They had different problems, different strengths and weaknesses. Not so different from the churches in the world today. Some things going right and some things going wrong. And I think we can learn from both their successes and their failures. The series, as we mentioned earlier, is called Hashtag Up to Us. If Nelson Christian Church is going to be a healthy church, if we're going to have a positive impact in our community, if we're going to make a difference here in Nelson County and around the world for Jesus Christ, it is up to us. Hashtag up to us. Because the hashtag suggests we're doing it together. We're in this together. We work together. We're united together. We're on the same team together. That's the hashtag. Because we're all in the same category. We began two weeks ago with the church in Ephesus. We said it was a legalistic church. And the message for them was to wise up. Sure, they were hardworking and they were faithful, but they had lost their love. They were going to the motions. No compassion for others. No real devotion to God. Last week, we saw the church in Smyrna, a persecuted church. The message from Jesus there was positive in the sense that they were faithful, they were committed in spite of all they were going through, but, but the message for them was a troubling message because Jesus said, things are hard now, they're about to get harder. They needed to toughen up because the persecution was going to intensify. And that sounds kind of harsh, toughen up. But Jesus knew how bad it was about to get, and he wanted them to brace themselves for what was coming. Now, the letter to the church in Pergamum or Pergamus, this was a, a liberal church. Not, not liberal politically, liberal theologically. They were struggling to maintain pure doctrine. There were people in the church that were abandoning the true gospel, and they were just kind of throwing their arms open wide, wide to every wind of teaching, to every false idea that came along. Honestly, it sounds familiar to what some churches and denominations are doing today. And Jesus suggests to them to grow up, to mature in the faith, to hold fast to what's true. So what I want to do today is I want to walk down through the text here in Revelation, this letter from Jesus. But I also want to show you something that happened in the Old Testament that plays right into this warning from Jesus. Again, almost right is still wrong. We'll come back to that. But let's pick up in Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus says this to John to write it down. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Jesus is dictating these letters to John to be delivered to these churches. And in each letter, Jesus begins by identifying himself as the sender of the letter. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Now, back in Revelation chapter 1, John received a vision of Jesus himself in heaven. And it has to be symbolic in some ways. Jesus is described as someone that looks like a son of man. In other words, he looks human in many ways. He's wearing a long robe with a gold sash. His hair is white as snow. Okay, so far. And then it says his eyes are like blazing fire. A little scary, but still okay. His feet are like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice sounds like rushing waters. I, I love that description. It's just so cool. But then it says, out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. There's got to be some symbolism to that. I'm no speech therapist, but I don't think you can talk if you've got a sword sticking out of your mouth. Besides the fact that your lips are going to get cut, you're going to be bleeding all over the place. I'm not making fun of this whole idea. I'm not saying that John was lying in what he saw. I'm just saying there has to be some kind of symbolism in whatever this looked like that John experienced in his vision. But what is this sword? What does it represent? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The book of Hebrews goes on to tell us in chapter 4 of that book that the Word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword, that it kind of slices right through us. It penetrates to the very core of our being. 
And now here in Revelation, we learn that the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, comes out of the mouth of Jesus himself. See, this letter to the church in Pergamum reminds us that when Jesus speaks, it's not only the Word of God, but it's like a sword that shows authority and strength, but also signifies a a, a weapon that that can pierce us to our very soul. So that's the one writing this letter. This is from Jesus, the one whose words must not be ignored, the one who has the power to kind of lay us bare and expose our hearts. And then he goes on in verse 13, I know where you live, he says to the church in Pergamum, where Satan has his throne. Now he's not saying, oh, you're hanging around with Satan and his throne. He's saying, look, this church is in a city that serves Satan. These believers have the guts to live in one of the most corrupt and pagan cities in the world at that time. They were shining the light of Jesus into complete darkness. See, we know from history that Pergamum was the seat of emperor worship for the entire Roman Empire. We know that an altar of Zeus was in the city that was 120 feet wide, 112 feet deep, and 18 feet high. It's on display today. That's a a picture of it at a museum in Berlin, Germany. Pergamum also had a shrine to Asclepius, the god of healing. In ancient mythology, Asclepius holds a staff in his hand with a snake wrapped around it. Snakes were regarded by the Greeks as um, as a, a, a sacred thing. And the venom was considered to be restorative because snakes can shed their skin. It suggested rebirth and renewal. And have you ever noticed that modern medicine uses a staff with a snake wrapped around it as a symbol? It actually comes from two ancient myths. Sometimes there's two snakes, and that's a different story. But this symbol that you see there is from Asclepius, this mythological god of healing. And apparently, according to mythology, Zeus killed Asclepius with a thunderbolt because he kept healing people and keeping them out of the underworld. Apparently, he got to have enough people dying, and so they had to fix that problem. But all of this points out that Pergamum was a hotbed of pagan worship. Satan did not have a literal throne there, but his presence was widespread, it was overwhelming, and the church in Pergamum sat right in the middle of all of that paganism. So Jesus kind of gets into this letter, and first he tells the church the things that they're doing right. Again, verse 13, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, and yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. See, Jesus points out that the Christians were facing intense persecution. And we don't know much about this guy, Antipas, this martyr, but Jesus holds him up as an example of those who were suffering in the early church because of their faith, and yet they were enduring to the very end. To their credit, he says, members of the Pergamum church refused to renounce their faith. And man, they were were holding true even in the face of death. And yet, in verse 14, Jesus turns a corner and he talks to them about their failures. This is what the church was doing wrong. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Not what you want to hear from Jesus. But he says, you have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now, we mentioned the Nicolaitans a couple of weeks ago when Jesus sent the letter to the church in Ephesus. Nicolaitans believed the flesh and the spirit had nothing to do with one another. That you could be devout in spirit and let your flesh run wild because the spirit, according to them, was incapable of controlling the flesh. Now, here's just a little side note. Maybe you'll win Trivial Pursuit someday with this. Nicolaitan comes from two words. It comes from Nikon, which means to conquer. If you wear Nike shoes, 
it means that you claim victory over your opponents. And if you use a Nikon camera, I guess that suggests that you have victory over those of us who shoot with a Canon camera. And yes, that is an intentional pun that I shoot with a Canon. And uh, the word Canon suggests the standard by which all others are judged, but I digress. If you want to use a Nikon and be wrong, that's fine. But anyway, <laughs> Canon did pay me to say that. Where were we? Okay, okay. Nicolaitan comes from Nikon, which means to conquer, and Laos, which means the people. And Jesus is not talking about conquering people in a military way. Listen, this is important. Nicolaitans believed the flesh conquers the spirit. So you might as well just let the flesh do whatever it wants. Give in to the flesh because it's always going to have victory over the mind and the will. The early church leader Irenaeus said of the Nicolaitans, they live lives of unrestrained indulgence. Now I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Unrestrained indulgence. We, we don't use the term Nicolaitan today. But when we tell teenagers or singles that it's fine to have sex before marriage, just make sure you're comfortable with it and make sure that you use a condom. What we're doing is saying to them, you don't have the will to honor God with your body, so just go ahead and give in to the flesh. When we tell people that it is healthy and God-honoring to live a homosexual lifestyle, bisexual, pansexual, polysexual, omnisexual, or fluid lifestyle, we're saying that the flesh takes precedent over the spirit and that our earthly bodies are more important than our eternal souls. That there's no way to control passion and desire. Now maybe you think this is a stretch, but let me just say this. We believe that women's rights are incredibly important, absolutely. But when we say that the rights of a woman become more important than the life of an unborn baby, it becomes a judgment call about serving flesh rather than the spirit. I don't know if you've been following this in the news, but former NFL coach and now commentator Tony Dungy is being vilified in the press right now because he plans to attend a national right to life rally in Washington, D.C. It's like our culture says, sure, it's fine to disagree, just don't disagree with us. Friends, I have no expectation that sports commentators are going to agree with me that the Bible is true, that sex outside of marriage is sin, or that abortion is murder. I just expect them to be decent human beings who can talk to me about football. I don't expect them to agree with my morals or my values. And yet, when a public figure upholds a different morality than the anything-goes morality of our culture, they're labeled hateful extremists. That's what he's being called because he wants to go to a right-to-life rally. Jesus condemns the church in Pergamum about this whole Nicolaitan thing. Not that they were all Nicolaitans, but that they allowed that kind of teaching into the church. Well, the flesh just is going to decide. Let it decide. But he also talks about those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Now, the story of Balaam in the Old Testament happens all the way back in the book of Numbers. I'm guessing you don't spend a whole lot of time in the book of Numbers. Balaam is exhibit A of our bottom line that almost right is still wrong. You read his story, and he starts out a good guy, and then he gets led astray. Then he makes a right decision, and it looks like he's done the right thing, but then he's revealed as a traitor. And I just want to warn you right now before we dig into his story for a minute that there is one of the more bizarre miracles in the Bible that happens right in the middle of his life. So let me set the stage for you. Then we'll talk about uh, why this might be tough for you to swallow, okay? Back in Numbers 22, the nation of Israel is wandering in the wilderness. Moses has led the, the Jews, the Israelites, out of slavery in Egypt. They're heading toward the promised land. They're not there yet. God's protecting them, <laughs> taking care of them. And they, they fight an army of Amorites, the, this, this nation, who tried to destroy them. And they defeated them with God's power. And so Balak... The king of Moab gets nervous. He's afraid the Israelites are going to come against them and defeat them as well. So he decides to be proactive and do something about this. He heard that there is a prophet of God nearby named Balaam. So he sends some messengers to see if he could pay Balaam to come over there and to curse the Israelites so they can't defeat the Moabites. You with me? He wants to hire 
a prophet of God to curse the people of God. Now, this is what you call in some circles a no-brainer, okay? You're a prophet of God. Somebody asks you to curse the people of God, and it's not a hard question to answer. You say no. No way am I going to do that, period, end of story. I'm not going to curse the people of God. But Balaam didn't say no way. He said, let me ask God what he thinks. And that sounds really spiritual, but not really. Think about it like this. Imagine a woman comes to a married man and says, would you like to have an affair with me? And he says, let me pray about it. He doesn't need to pray about it. He needs to say no, because it's a terrible idea, right? But Balaam doesn't say no way. He says, let me see what God thinks about this whole idea. Balaam heard that Balak the king was offering to pay a nice reward for a good old-fashioned cursing. And so he leaves the door open for the possibility. But God says, no, don't go. You can't curse my people. I'm blessing them. So Balaam goes back to Balak, and he says, God won't let me. He doesn't say, no, it's a stupid idea. He says, God won't let me, and he leaves the door open again. So Balak offers more money, sends more messengers, and Balaam says, let me talk to God again. He says, God, can I go, can I go, can I go? And God's like, if you're going to keep bugging me about it, you can go, but you only get to say what I tell you, you can say. But God's angry. Balaam is not doing the right thing. He's after the money. We know that because in 2 Peter 2.15 in the New Testament, it says Balaam, son of Beor, loved to earn money by doing wrong. Doesn't get much more clear than that. So God says Balaam can go, but God is ticked at Balaam because of his greed. Friends, Balaam should have said, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. This might be close to God's will, but it's not really God's will. I ought to not go. Balaam should have been able to say, had he been a member of Nelson Christian Church, he could have said, a very wise pastor once told me, uh, close, you know, only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Almost right is still wrong, but he was not a member. He did not say that. And so God said, go, fine, go, but God is just mad. So this is what sets up one of the craziest miracles in the Bible. Balaam, the next morning, saddles up his donkey, and he sets out with the messengers of Balak. And three times, an angel of the Lord appears in the road to block his way. But you need to understand this. The only one who can see the angel is the donkey, right? And so when the donkey sees the angel, he runs away. And Balaam beats the donkey for running. So then he gets back on the donkey and he goes a little farther and the angel is standing there in a narrow passageway and the donkey rams up against the wall and smashes Balaam's foot and he's really mad now and he beats the donkey again in subordination. (laughs) And I just picture these messengers and they're thinking... This guy's supposed to save our nation, and he can't even ride a donkey. You know, really, this is the guy? But anyway, and, and so a third time, the angel stands in the road, and this time the donkey just sits down. And Balaam is so embarrassed and he's so frustrated, he beats the heck out of that donkey again. And that's what sets up this miracle. Numbers 22 28. Man, I wish I had a video of this. Then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. What have I done to you that deserves you beating me these three times? It asks Balaam. And what does Balaam do? Does Balaam pass out, you know, from shock? Or does Balaam say, do I have a fever? Do I look okay to you guys? Or or, or does he dig in his saddlebag and pull out his homemade hooch and throw it away? i got to stop drinking that stuff. No, 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 no. He argues with the donkey. Verse 29. You've made me look like a fool, Balaam shouts. If I had a sword with me, I would kill you right now. (laughs) The donkey says, but am I not the same donkey you've ridden all your life? Have I ever done anything like this before? (laughs) Well, no, Balaam admits. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the roadway with a drawn sword in his hand, and Balaam bowed his head and fell face down on the ground before him. Okay, the main point of the story is Balaam's sinfulness, but the only thing you're thinking about right now is the talking donkey, so let's talk about that just for a second. (laughs) We are accustomed to talking animals, aren't we? Sure we are. They're in stories we call fairy tales, right? Maybe when you think talking donkey, donkey, this is, this is what you picture, right? That's, that's exactly what you were thinking. Eddie Murphy in Shrek, right? 
Now, all I can tell you is this. This is where I am. And you may not be here, but this is where I am. If God could create the universe, and I believe he did, then he is powerful enough to provide a great fish to swallow Jonah and, and, and to protect Daniel in the lion's den and to help David kill Goliath. And I think God is big enough to make a donkey talk if he wants to because God is big enough to do whatever he wants to do. That's what I believe. Now, what cracks me up is that Balaam has a talking donkey and he threatens to kill it. I'm thinking, go to Vegas, make a fortune, right? I mean, come on. This is going to be the best sideshow in town. But what does Balaam say to the angel? This is unbelievable, too, in verse 34. I have sinned, he said. I did not realize you were standing in the road to block my way. I will, listen, <laughs> I will return home if you are against me going. If you don't want me to go. I mean, is Balaam stupid? I mean, is it, what's going on here? Is God upset? I just can't tell. Balaam is stubborn, so God says, just go, but you're only going to say what I tell you to say. And so he goes, and it's a long story, but Balaam blesses the people every time Balak says, please curse them, because God only lets him bless the people. He wants the money, so he keeps trying, but God keeps saying, no, you cannot curse them. Now, this is where we really see the bottom line, almost right, is still wrong. It looks like Balaam finally obeys the Lord. He did the right thing. He blessed the Israelites. He did not curse them. Almost, but not quite. See, we don't know everything that happened here, but Balaam went and sat down with Balak the king and had a meeting. And, and we know that what happened later is that the Israelites camped out near the people of Moab, this pagan nation, and instead of fighting against each other, or instead of the Israelites avoiding them, we know the Jews started hanging out with the Moabites, and the Jewish men started fooling around with some of the Moabite women, and the Israelites started going to church with some of the Moabites in their pagan temples and worshiping their false gods. And you, you ask yourself, well, where did Balak, the king, get the idea that instead of fighting the Israelites, he could lead them astray lead them into sin by corrupting them morally and spiritually. He got the idea from Balaam, the prophet of God. In Numbers 31, it describes the women of Moab. It says in verse 16, these are the very ones, listen, who followed Balaam's advice and caused the people of Israel to rebel against the Lord. And that brings us all the way back from the book of Numbers, all the way up to the book of Revelation again. Verse 14, this time let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. Balaam showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. Balaam never cursed the Israelites because God would not let him. Instead, he showed Balak how to weaken them and how to undermine them and ultimately how to defeat them. Not with swords and spears, but with loose women and false gods. Balaam looked like a follower of God, but he really wasn't. I mean, he went to church, he sang all the songs, he, he tithed of his income, maybe he raised his hands when he sang, he, he had a little fish symbol, maybe on the back of his chariot. But he was a prophet of God, and yet he's leading his own people astray. So close. The close doesn't count. He was almost right, but almost right is still wrong. Balaam never became the man God called him to be. He obeyed with his mouth, but not with his heart. And he ended up being killed by his own people, the Israelites, when they finally defeated the Moabites in battle because Balaam chose the wrong team. And so we're here in the book of Revelation again now. And Jesus says there were some people in the church in Pergamum who were just like Balaam. They thought sexual immorality and pagan worship, oh, it's just part of the culture. It's no big deal. It's a part of life. God won't mind if we get mixed up in that. And there were people in the church who were following false teaching. Sure, they did not deny the faith when persecution started. They just watered down the faith to the point that they allowed false teachers to rise up in the congregation. And what did Jesus say to them? Verse 16, repent. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against you, fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Gail's dad, my father-in-law, wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, and he pointed out that the sword from Jesus here, the sword was not to be used against the pagans in the city, but rather against the compromisers in the church. 
And so Jesus says, grow up. Mature in your faith. This is what the church needed to do differently. They had to turn from their sin. That's what it means to repent, to turn from sin. They refused to turn. They refused to silence the false teachers. Jesus said he would come himself and fight against them with what? With the sword of his mouth, with the power of his word. God's word is the weapon of choice against false teaching. It's the offensive weapon we have against those who would deny the gospel. Repent and turn back. Or through the power of Jesus' word, he's going to fight, he says, until he's the last one standing. Okay, Jesus is almost finished, and so am I. But he's writing this letter to the church in Pergamum, the last verse in the text. He says in verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, listen, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Manna in the Old Testament was bread from heaven. It was sent to feed the Israelites. Remember, they're wandering in the wilderness. They're they're hungry. God sends miraculous bread from heaven to nourish their bodies. And now Jesus says here that there will be another kind of bread from heaven, a metaphor for his word delivered by the Spirit of God. And his word is like bread. It's like a sword in that it can divide us and penetrate our hearts. But it's like bread because it nourishes us and it feeds us. It satisfies us. And so he says, I've got this bread for those who overcome. But then he says, there's a white stone with a new name written on it. Isn't that interesting? In ancient times, white stones were a symbol of purity. They were also a symbol of approval. Sometimes when votes were being cast, people had either a black stone or a white stone. And maybe they were going for or against an idea or for or against a person. And they would put their stone to show for or against. And the white stone always represented approval. And so these white stones in Revelation suggest somebody who has been purified. Somebody who has received God's approval. And they receive a new name. You think about how powerful names can be. We see it over and over again in the Bible, how powerful a specific name is that's given for a specific reason. Now, sometimes names are negative. We talk about people, you know, calling people names, and we usually mean that as a bad thing. Maybe it's a profane name or a racial slur, or we minimize somebody in some way. Oh, you're stupid. You're ugly. You're lazy. You're fat. You're a coward. You're a mudblood. Sorry to throw that in. But um, just this whole idea... That a name can be a negative thing, but here you're given a new name written on a white stone. And there's something so special about this name. There's something that's so personal and so precious that it's known only to that person and to Jesus. Something that's intimate just between the two. He's giving each one a new name that in some way encapsulates how strongly he feels about that person. How valuable they are to him. How precious they are. And they have it written in stone so they can hold it in their hands and they can hold it close and keep it forever. Those who overcome receive that. Those who do not fall prey to false teaching. Those who do not give in to opposition and persecution. And friends, these letters that were written in Revelation are also written to us today. Jesus said to the church last week, he said, if you are faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of life. And here he says, if you overcome, I'm going to give you a white stone. It's going to have a name on it that's just yours, only yours. And I I know it and you know it. And it just shows how much I love you. And, and, And that's what we're promised. Now look, the bottom line was a warning. Almost right is still wrong. Don't be like the Nicolaitans. Don't be like Balaam. Don't pretend to be faithful, but really embrace the world's values. Not enough to look good on the outside. You got to be changed on the inside. All that's important to remember, but don't miss this. Jesus says, overcome. (coughs) Jesus says, stay faithful. Persevere. Keep being true to the gospel overcome because you do that and the promise is true there is a crown of life waiting for you there is bread from heaven that will nourish you and there is a new name inscribed on a white stone it is just for you and it signifies that you belong to God and that you will live with Jesus forever overcome overcome let's pray Father, your word is so full of promises. And the book of Revelation, in many ways, so full of symbols. 
And here's this assurance that when we are hungry, you will fill us. That when we are struggling, God, you will strengthen us. That through the power of your word, you can pierce our hearts. And you can work on us at the core of our being. But God, this promise too, that there is a new name inscribed on a white stone. And we can clutch that stone and always remember remember that we belong to you. God, may we be faithful. May we overcome that these promises for us might be true. And that's the prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.